Okay, thank you very much, um, everybody, for being here. And um, thank you for very interesting talk um, about the public sector. Um, I'm going to talk to you um, about some work that we've been doing in um, STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics uh, sectors. And actually, there are some very strong parallels with the kind of things we've just heard about in terms of women's careers and the gender issues within organizations. So um, um, I'm going to start uh, telling you a little bit about what the background to the, the, the work that we've been doing. And then my colleagues, Katie, Chico, and um, Elaine Thomas will um, tell you a little bit more. Katie's going to tell you, uh, show you some of the resources that we've developed for women coming back from career breaks. And then Elaine will talk a little bit about the context here in Northern Ireland uh, and how the, the STEM picture particularly affects women in this area. You may be or may not be surprised to know that uh, amongst women who take career breaks from uh, STEM careers, so already that's a, a minority amount of uh, numbers of women in this sector, over two thirds of women who take breaks uh, who have the STEM qualifications don't go back into the STEM sectors after a break. Many of them do go back to work, but the majority don't go back into STEM work. And that um, is a huge problem both for um, industry and also for government. Uh, if you think about the, the talent and the training and the expertise that uh, is lost to those sectors due to this figure. So this was a starting point for a number of initiatives that we've been doing at the Open University. So um, as we've just heard from Joan, uh, and I think this applies in the STEM areas uh, as well as other industry areas, careers are gendered. There are gender things going on when we talk about people's careers. It's not gender neutral. Um, the traditional cultures and career structures within particularly many of the old professions such, such as engineering and also in scientific research in universities, is very much based on the the male model of working, which is a full-time, lifelong career without any breaks. Uh, and even within the IT sector, there are kind of new models of masculine work that are emerging, which again emulate these kind of long hours cultures and very intense work patterns that are based on this, uh, this, this uh, perceived notion of uh, the, the male career, let's say. So this is kind of known uh, in a way, this is the ideal worker, and therefore what women are doing is uh, in somehow an aberration from the norm. So in organizations that are structured in this way, it's the, the, everything uh, in the working life reproduces these gendered patterns. So women's careers are always kind of at a tangent with what's expected. And this is also what gets rewarded. So uninterrupted careers, full-time careers get rewarded. And we've just seen that in the statistics we just heard about. To rise to the top, you really need to be doing that particular type of model of working. But of course, as we know, uh, and as we've heard, women's careers are, do not fit this model all the time. Um, they're often non-linear, there are often a number of breaks, there are periods of part-time working. And all of these compound the fact that um, the, the, the successful career is more difficult to attain. And in particular, career breaks and periods of part-time work are, have an impact on progression. And these accumulate, so once uh, someone has taken a break, worked for part-time uh, for a period, this uh, exacerbates the lack of progress. So it's very difficult, uh, let's say, to regain traction after those uh, events have happened. So the work that we've been doing has been focusing particularly on this point of the career, the, the career break and the return from career break, because we want to see what we can do to uh, improve the prospects of women who are coming back in after the break. Now, returners, uh, we found, um, are not one-size-fits-all model. They're diverse in age, background, and also in reasons for being out of work. S often it is having a child, but it's not always that. And it may be a combination of childcare, elder care, uh, 
caring for dependents, others, sickness, redundancy, all sorts of things, factors come in. So it's not a, a, a sort of straightforward picture. Um, and it's often a combination of push factors and pull factors. So it's the draw of needing to look after the family, but also the hostile conditions in a workplace that don't allow that. So these two things go together in a way. And the longer the break, the harder it is to get back in, and particularly into STEM areas, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and as I said before, this survey that the um, UK, UK government did um, found that two-thirds of women did not go back into STEM work. And getting back into STEM, so in particular uh, technology work, scientific research, are very, very difficult after taking a break because of these are rapidly changing sectors. So being out of the IT sector for a couple of years means that you're very out of date with skills, things have moved on, and confidence is very reduced. So there are particular things about STEM-related occupations that make it even harder. Uh, and of course, because they are predominantly male-dominated in the sheer numbers of, of people in those sectors, uh, this makes it very difficult for those organisations to adapt and change to these, to these needs. So um, we developed some, uh, on the back of that uh, research, we developed a um, course for called Return to Set. Um, and that was the first large scale um, online course for women returners. There have been many things that go on locally and support mechanisms for women over the years, but this was a, a, a very large online course that we ran. And we had over a thousand women who took the course in that period of time. And we did a follow-up study in 2011-2012 with the women that have participated in that to find out what success factors, what had worked for them um, in, in terms of coming back into employment. And we had 167 women who responded. Um, and we did biographical interviews with a sample of those just to find out more detail about what the story was, what were the things that helped. And we identified the barriers as well as the success stories in their return. And the key barriers that they found in returning were sort of fell into three different things. One to the left is the kind of predominance, again, of the expectations of gender roles. So it was a combination. It's not just about the workplace, but it was also their social situation, their families, their own expectations of themselves. So um, having that predominant role in childcare, in domestic work, unequal share of domestic work and so on, all had, a, had an impact. Um, where they lived and their ability to be mobile was also a huge factor. So st especially with STEM work, you need to be a bit more mobile, you need to go where the work is. It's, you can't necessarily get that kind of, those kind of work, uh, occupations in your local area. And then there were the structural institutional bar barriers, which we've heard a, a little bit about from Joan, and similar things happen in the STEM industries. So organisations that make it very difficult and are not particularly welcoming <coughs> to women who've taken a break or who are seen not to be up to um, coming back into the workplace. Um, so in terms of the impact of the intervention, we had a number of, we asked them all sorts of things, and the, we've got a couple of quotes here. Uh, just to give you uh, an example, so um, on the right was one woman who had been a software engineer um, and she said that the course was crucial in getting, uh, um, starting her journey back into commercial work. It built up her confidence and I think this is one of the key things that we found with returners is the fact that having confidence, a lack of confidence was a real barrier and they needed some first step to get back in. And being in touch with others was another really important thing. So feeling that they were not alone, that their experience was, some, was shared rather than some personal aberration of their own or some dif dysfunction of their own. And so that gave them the confidence to apply for jobs. And in terms of the strategies for getting back in, we found there were five different top strategies. So first of all, getting a foot in the door was really important. So that was... Uh, there are a number of kind of uh, examples of that. I'll come on to one in a minute. Networking was key. So who you know, developing contacts, 
uh, um, up to 70% of jobs are not advertised. I don't know if you knew that. But uh, many jobs just are uh, word of mouth and so on. So networking and contacts was a hugely important thing. Retraining for those that really felt the skills had not been um, up to date. So a number of them retrained and t took a slightly different uh, direction with their careers. Uh, and quite a few had what we'd called helping hand. They had other agencies and support agencies who were there to help them, careers advisors, local projects, and we'll talk about that in a minute, who gave them that support through that difficult time. And then there were a group who, what we've called back to basics, where they really felt <coughs> they couldn't resume their career at the level that they had before. And they would go, in, and this happened to quite a number, uh, they would go into a lower paid, lower status job because that was all that they could manage. So having been highly trained, sometimes PhD level, they, some women, for example, were work, went to work as school science technicians because it fitted with the patterns that they, with the work patterns, but of course they were on a fraction of the kind of salary they could have got if they were back in industry. So although that suited them, it really was not a, a very positive strategy for their career. Um, oh, wait a minute, sorry. Um, so I just want to tell you, work, give you one example of this strategy of getting a foot in the door. Um, there have been a number of companies now who have started what they call returnships. And this is something that's catching on quite a lot. I'm not sure whether that's uh, very, happening very much here in Northern Ireland, but um, I've seen it. We where um, companies are giving um, uh, paid or unpaid internships but for older people, so people coming back into the workplace. And this is a really, really important kind of development because it actually gives them that lift up and that recent experience of work which they can then um, they can use. So this is an example of someone who's running um, a returnship in London and uh, she features actually on some of our materials that we've developed. We started a returner programme in uh, 2015 and the, the theory behind that was really to say there are a lot of people out there who are looking to return back into the marketplace and finding it difficult and for us as employers it's a huge untapped pool of resource and particularly in STEM type subjects where there are less people uh, available in the marketplace than jobs at the moment. So for us it was a real a real win-win situation. So we uh, went out to market, we had a range of roles from um, finance through to engineering, project managers, um, legal. So there's this whole range and we actually took seven returners onto the project. We were originally looking for six, but we, uh, we couldn't resist and we took seven. Um, and they came on for a 12-week paid internship um, doing very specific roles on the project. Um, we have since, we, we, everyone stayed beyond that 12-week project and currently we actually have six of the seven are still employed on the project. Uh, a number of those are in permanent roles, others are in project roles um, that are going on for several months. For us, the benefits of a returner programme was that you have someone who's done it before and what you're doing is you're helping them get back into the market. Now, they might need a bit more support, but that investment really repays itself incredibly quickly. I mean, within the first week of people being on the project, they were starting to make a difference. They needed a bit of help, you know, getting their confidence in some instances, but actually their, their contribution from very, very early stages was phenomenal. And it did give us all those, that skills and experience that if we'd have gone out to market generally, we may have found we may not. And for us, it was a win-win situation. And, and what is really important to us as well is uh, the, the passion for the project. And people came in and that's what they wanted. And actually, if you think of graduates and their enthusiasm, we had the same enthusiasm from the returners, but actually with experience. So it was a, it was a great great success and we are running another program we're literally just out in the market at the moment advertising again I'm going to hand over to Katie and she's going to tell you a little bit about um, the the new resources so on the back of the research that we did about the previous iteration we developed two new types of courses based on that and Katie's going to tell you a little bit about that okay so um, can you hear me to stand here I'm not massive, is it? Uh, so 
We had the course that Clem told you about, which a thousand women enrolled on. It was a credit bearing course, but it was part of a funded project. And the funding regime changed, and how universities were structured was changed. And so we needed an alternative way to present the materials. And so we now have altered the materials to sit on OpenLearn, which is the Open University's free learning portal. So all the materials we're going to show you are free to be used, free to be adapted, as long as you credit them. Um, we really are keen to spread the word to get them used in whatever format works for whatever audience. So these things are available. So we made, a, and it's a badge course, so you get like a, a kind of a certificate at the end. Our, we have a mission to promote open learning, and this course fits within that mission. It's, um, it's not a formal course that's credit bearing, it's what takes people from where they are informally to a formal place of learning, perhaps retraining. Um, it sits on OpenLearn, so you can pick it up whenever you're ready. It has a set structure, but you do study it at your own pace. And this particular course is eight weeks long with three hours per week, but basically you can stretch that out. And we did adapt the course to be really quite interactive. There's lots of elements to the course. It's, it's not just learning, not just reading, rather. So I'll give you kind of an idea of what is in this Badge Open course. And it's a very, it's a different kind of learning to one of our standard courses because it's all about the learner getting ready to go back into the marketplace, back into the workplace, or perhaps back into learning. Um, so the whole structure of the course is about reflecting on yourself. So the eight weeks, start with week one, have a good reflection about how you've got to where you are. And so there's quite nice activities where you might draw a graph of your life. When did it go up? What was good and positive about that? What factors brought you up? When you were down, what brought you down? What do you want to avoid doing again? So really, really quite engaging activities. And we begin a little bit about getting people online. We actually use LinkedIn to get people online, slightly out of the comfort zone of First of all, just building up their CV, that's fine. We need to build up their CV, do it via the medium of LinkedIn. But we also want to start them making connections with people. So just tentatively build up your networks again. Get yourself going, get yourself out there a little bit. Then we do some fairly serious work on how the STEM industry is developing, what the future trends might be, where they might see some gaps. Um, we do some work in week four on the new legislation about flexible work, what you can ask for, what might be available. You know, things have changed while people have been on career breaks. And then we spend quite a bit of time in week five, where people have to honestly look at the time they've got and where are the gaps in those time, what will they have to change to try and fit in some work. So is, is there any time that they can squeeze, is there anything they can change? It's not, just, it's not just come out of the air, you've got to find a place to fit the work. One of the big factors which help women getting back into work is having a supportive network. So that might be a supportive work network, certainly helps if you've got a supportive home network. So we spend time with the returners, getting them to map out their networks. Who would help you with this problem? What are you gonna, where are you going to get support for that problem? So sit down and actually, you know, really write down who's going to help you with this, that and the other. Who's going to help you if you've got a childcare emergency? What are you going to do about this particular problem? And then by the time we get to week seven, they actually can gather together their information from LinkedIn and start to build a proper CV, start to build proper um, job applications, actually do some real searching on the internet, direct them to search engines, and um, genuinely start to apply for jobs. Or look at training courses if you've identified a gap. And we kind of round off by uh, doing another reflection and writing a letter to yourself. Where would you like to be in five years? What do you want your life to look like? Not what job will you have, but what will the job feel like? What will you be doing? How will you, be, um, what, how will you feel about your status? 
So it's a very reflective course and it's quite interactive and enjoyable and there's lots in there um, to make people feel good about themselves, there's lots of boosting activities. And one particular boosting activity is looking at the employer perspective of our returners. So I've got a, um, a clip here. We've got a kind of real business need um, for kind of looking to kind of encourage people to come back into STEM just now across the energy industry by 2023 47% of the workforce can retire and it really means we need to be really thoughtful about kind of expanding and fishing in every single talent pool that we can get into and we think there's a reasonably untapped talent pool here and we need to work hard to be in it um, and to be seen as an attractive employer within it organisations have started to realise that they're going to inadvertently miss out on the talent pool if they don't think a little, little bit more widely and they're going to miss out on experience and that there's an untapped market. So I think things have changed. I think certainly so my peer group talking in the energy sector, I think there's been an awful lot more focus on inclusion and diversity. And when you talk to people about why they're doing it, most of it isn't because it's a feel-good factor. Most of it's actually because, you know, there is a kind of talent issue across the whole STEM sector. We haven't attracted enough people in in the last few years. And so if we've got people that want to come back that have actually proven themselves before, there's an untapped resource. And, and I would probably argue that employers, I think, are probably starting to get their head around that if they take a good graduate now, it's going to take a few years to get up to speed. If somebody's actually been up to speed, they've had a few years out, but they know what to do, we'll get them up to speed more quickly. So I, I actually think there's quite a firm business case now for actually fishing in this talent pool. And all the numbers suggest that, you know, if we don't get more creative and innovative about filling our skills gap, we're going to have a challenge as an industry. I think it's a huge boost for our returners to hear it's like 40% they can, they can expect to lose. Um, and with those kinds of numbers of vacancies, you've got to think, maybe there's a vacancy for me. So there's a lot in there to boost women. Uh, we know the vacancies are going to be there. So, and we know the returners are out there and want to get back in. So it's really just a case of having the right policies, the right structures in place to get them back in. Uh, we actually made two resources. I'm going to very briefly cover the other one because I know um, we, the time is going by. So we made a badged open course, but we also made a light version, something you might just tap on your phone while you sat beside a swimming lesson or something. So this is like the app, as it were, and it, it mimics what we do in the course. We've got the key skills you have to do to be job ready, and it's a bit like a petrol tank. When you fill up each of these activities, you're, you're job ready. Um, people have busy lives, so when you fill in your initial questionnaire, it'll tell you which bits you've already done, and then you just need to click through the other activities to um, uh, complete your, for example, understanding of life balance. The activities are quite light and interactive, so if you're doing your work balance, you can just tap in your hours for how much time you're going to be spending commuting, sleeping, and you might, you know, I assume the people in this room all find their own negative time and actually not get hands up. Um, and we probably all do need to have a good look at this and change things a little bit. Um, but people do need to honestly look at their time before they think, oh, well, I'll have a job as well. It's been um, well used. We've had lots of people, we only launched this in May, um, we've had lots of people access the site and register as users. What we haven't been able to do yet is evaluate it um, because these people are dipping into the site and going away again. However, what we are doing as our next phase is these materials are forming the backbones for projects in Scotland. So there's a group called Equate in Scotland who are funded by the Scottish Parliament and they do various um, gender equality work. And they're running a returners program. So it takes the Batched Open course and it does some wraparound activities. And to me this is like the gold standard of what we could offer. So we have the activities to make them job ready, but they're also providing returnships for each of these participants. Um, there will be some face-to-face -face networking as well. We'll be part of peer groups, so they've got that add-on extra support that we can't provide by ourselves through an online course. And this will be evaluated. We will be able to do in-depth interviews with these women and see 
you know, how we provide what they needed to have. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Elaine now to speak about the local setting and uh, direct issues kind of work. Hi there. I thought I'd just spend five minutes or so just giving uh, some context to uh, Northern Ireland and looking uh, maybe at how we might uh, sort of adapt the work that we've been showing you this morning, uh, this afternoon, to the Northern Ireland situation. Now, as we know that the importance of STEM skills and qualifications are well recognised in Northern Ireland. Um, there's been a lot of work being going on in uh, certainly in the last seven, eight, nine years on sort of supporting the development of STEM and promoting it amongst young people. And but some of the work has actually sort of shown up the sort of the either the gender issues here there. So as we know that 11% of high level posts are in STEM in Northern Ireland, but. Uh, men outnumber uh, women by nearly three to one in these posts. Um, although we know that more females than males progress to higher education, that's about 83% female and 71% uh, male, you know, there are important differences in the subjects being studied. We know that, for example, 62% uh, of STEM enrolments are male in Northern Ireland. 29.8% uh, 20, of all STEM graduates are female. 26% uh, of students in computer science are female. And 21% of students in engineering and technology are female. Now, that is actually much, much better than it is in the UK. For example, uh, the BCS uh, IT scorecard, which covers the whole whole of the UK, it shows that you know only 13% of uh, people studying uh, computer science are female, are women. That 17% of women qualified in computer science, and 12% are in, in, are actually working in an IT specialism. So there has been a lot of work being going on, but though, though this, the, these numbers are better in comparison with the UK generally, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done. So the STEM strategy in Northern Ireland has said there's been a lot of work that's been done in Northern Ireland uh, to promote STEM and particularly the success through STEM strategy, which was kind of aiming to promote STEM to young people and was particularly uh, concerned to in, let businesses take the lead in, in doing this. And one of the outcomes of the uh, success through STEM strategy was the uh, STEM business subgroup, which was set up to take forward five of the recommendations and this one that was of particular importance to us is the recommendation on addressing gender bias in STEM. There, so uh, this is then, this is actually uh, sort of all figures from the Department of Employment and Learning in Northern Ireland. Um, the outcome of this then, the was a comprehensive report was actually uh, produced uh, by the STEM uh, business group and it's led by Joanne Campbell and they produced a lot of uh, sort of really good ideas on how to address uh, the gender bias in STEM and one their report was very comprehensive um, and basically they, what they were doing was setting out the kind of the business case for promoting a sort of equality in STEM area, for gender equality in STEM. So they produced tools such as the, the uh, STEM Chief, Chief Executive uh, Officer uh, Charter. Um, which these were intended to help businesses to engage with STEM. And they also had good practice guidelines covering pre-employment and employment, which again were very helpful. And they also had a series of about seven case studies from local businesses, which were very sort of showed how local businesses were engaging with the STEM agenda. So 
so in addition, there was also a, uh, a STEM equality, employer equality network, which was set up to share good practice and provide advice and guidance on gender issues in the workplace. So this is all you know, extremely valuable work in encouraging women into STEM employment. And also, I mean, it was the whole issue of uh, STEM in women, women in STEM was actually brought into the assembly in another debate uh, the year before last. Um, so it is very much on the agenda here, but there are obviously there are other issues that still need to be taken forward. Um, for example, you know, as we noted earlier in the presentation, that over two thirds of women with STEM qualifications don't go back into the STEM sector after their career break. So what I'll show you next <coughs> is uh, just a, what was a pilot project run about eight or nine years ago um, on uh, using materials from the return to science engineering technology, as it was called in those days, of course. And this was a, um, a project uh, which was a pilot project called um, the Re-Enter Project. And this was actually a collaboration between the Open University and uh, the Women into Technology and Science group, which is across uh, you know, sort of both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, also, also known as WITS. Um, it was actually funded by Intertrade Ireland, um, and it, which was again a sort of north-south body, um, and it was launched by the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Employment, uh, Mr. Michal Martin, who was the, the, uh, the minister at that stage, in, uh, and it was actually launched in Dublin. So the Reenter pro pilot program was set up to identify suitably scientifically and technically qualified women who wanted to return to the workforce following career breaks. So the idea was that participants would study the return to SET course, but they were also offered mentoring opportunities and provided with uh, support and networking opportunities during the programme. And the programme, which ran from 2007 to the end of 2009, was very successful. And the report from uh, in the Intertrade Ireland for 2009 notes that results from the 20 graduates who participated in this programme show that 14 of the 20 women participating have returned to science en engineering and technology careers and a further five are actively seeking employment. So this is a model, it was a pilot project, and it, we're very enthusiastic about this model of supporting women to return to STEM. You know, we in the Open University have developed the resources, but we know that the model works best when we have local partnerships. Um, this can be to adapt the materials slightly, for example, providing local uh, links to local resources, but also it works well when there are local mentors, and particularly well when we have local employers who can provide returnships, for example, as in the project in Scotland. So finally, I'd just like to say that the materials that have been developed are freely available under a Creative Commons licence, so people can take them and use them. Uh, although we do expect an acknowledgement, obviously, on, under the, the use of that. But we are very interested in the whole idea of working with local partners. As I say, we have the materials already, and we're quite willing to sort of look at new projects to um, sort of see uh, if we can work together to progress this idea. All right, thank you. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you.